It is week eight in the world of college football, and I got to give you my picks against the spread. And we are going to break down some of the most important games of this college football slate because we have seen major upsets in previous weeks, and there are teams that are primed to get upset again. And we have some games that are going to determine who's going to make the playoffs and who is going to be left on the outside. This college football season has been actually weird because you are having some of the best teams play midweek games. You're having Oregon this year. This is their second Friday game, and this one against Purdue comes on the heels of a huge win versus Ohio State. So is that a huge letdown spot or anything like that? For the Ducks, we obviously have to talk about that. And then you got BYU playing Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, who has absolutely disappointed this year, but this is one of them opportunities that they can not just boost their own season, but wreck somebody else's, and they would love to do that. Because if you can't win a national title or get to the playoffs, what's the next best thing? To make sure that your rival or somebody else in your conference does not get to go. And before we break down those things, let's talk about this Miami at Louisville game because this is a game that I've been waiting on because everybody when you look at this Miami schedule they don't have one single ranked team a team that they played that is currently ranked or a team that they are supposed to play that is currently ranked so that makes things very interesting and difficult for them and uh, I made a video earlier this season over at Unafraid Show, and it wasn't even a full video. It was a short. And I said that the ACC is going to go through Miami. And I'm not exaggerating at all when I say that over a third of the 200 plus comments were from Louisville fans telling me to wait till week eight. But this is your time, Louisville. <laughs> this is the time that y'all all told me about that not only with your two losses now, but now you can wreck Miami season and put yourself in a position to get to the ACC championship. Because remember, the making the playoff is no longer just about being one of the top 12 teams. No, it's about winning your conference because if you are one of the four highest conference champions, then you are going to get a bye into the first round. You're going to be into one of the top four seeds. Let's see what you got, Louisville, because you can be the first team to upset the Canes this year. But the question is, can they do it? Because Louisville, they are a seriously competitive team at home. And last year, they even won in Miami. So Miami fans who struggled in Cal, they struggled versus Virginia Tech. You can't get too overconfident at this point in time because you will find yourself with a major problem on your hands. But I will give Miami some credit though, because this is not the same Miami team from last year that fell apart. This year, the Canes have an electric quarterback in Cam Ward, and they brought in Damian Martinez at running back from Oregon State. And they got Mark Fletcher as well. And then you got Elijah Arroyo, who's having a breakout year at the tight end position. You add that in with Restrepo and the rest of this wide receiver crew. This is a team that has major weapons and a quarterback in Cam Moore that can extend plays. And people are wondering if he's going to be a first round NFL pick. I don't see it, but people are talking about it. And now all that firepower that Miami has actually worries me a little bit because they had two weeks to prepare for this game. And Louisville just finished giving up 900 combined yards to SMU and Virginia. So that is something that is highly concerning. But maybe if they can't hang defensively, maybe Louisville can hang offensively. Because after all, they got my guy Tyler Shuck at quarterback. And the two of us have this little side bet going on this year. If he throws touchdowns, I'll stop pronouncing his name wrong like I did when he was at the University of Oregon. I'm joking. The kid's amazing. Um, and Chuck's going to have to chuck. You see what I did there? Chuck, chuck. Because Miami has the best run defense on the East Coast right now. Louisville running back Isaac Brown had 120 yards against Virginia last week. And that's 30 more than the Canes have given up as a team. And when you factor all of that in, Miami is minus four and a half and give me the Canes. And honestly, that may turn out to be a jinx for them because I have uh, not been believers in them like everybody else. But I did. I was right. I told everybody they weren't going to cover against Cal. And the same thing with Virginia Tech. And those things came true, even though the Canes won. But I am taking Miami minus four and a half. And if I'm wrong, 
then you can call me the Minch. Make sure that you guys like, subscribe, get notifications for The Unafraid Show, and most importantly, share people. Share the show, share the feed. I'm gonna give you a second right now. Go down, click it, click it, click it. Share and leave a thumbs up and everything in between. Next game up, Nebraska at Indiana, minus six and a half. Who on earth in the preseason thought that this could be the game that could determine who ends up in a Big Ten championship game or who ends up in a New Year six bowl game because Nebraska was coming off of seven consecutive losing seasons. They're in a position to be bowl eligible. Indiana is at this point in time undefeated and atop the Big Ten standings with Oregon. But the question is though, which one of these teams is for real? Because Nebraska fans will tell you, it's them. <laughs> and they have a win over Colorado where the defensive line looked like the 2002 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And against Rutgers, this defense looked fully complete. And that's good because Indiana has scored in 23 of the last 24 quarters that they have played this year. This offense is not playing around. Seriously though, if the season ended today, Indiana head coach Kurt Sengetti is the coach of the year. Curtis Roy could be on the Heisman stage and Mikel Kamara is a Chuck Bednarik finalist. The Hoosiers were this year's first bowl eligible team just one year after going one and eight in the Big Ten. Do you realize how insane that that is? So Indiana fans have to be feeling like this is a special season or that they are a team of destiny right now. And this game in Bloomington, Indiana, they got a noon kickoff. And for Nebraska, the stakes couldn't be higher because can Nebraska secure their first six win season since Barack Obama was in office? Do you know how long that was ago? I will say though, if Nebraska has any shot of winning this game, it's gonna be because they do what no team has done against Indiana aside from Maryland this year. And that's forced turnovers because you cannot win this game without winning the turnover battle. And you probably, if you're Nebraska, can't win this game without scoring 35 points, which Nebraska hasn't done against any Big Ten opponent for their last 17 tries. Because this Indiana offense is absolutely explosive. They put up major points and they do some good things by protecting the football. And Indiana, they actually just need to sell out and defend the run and make Dylan Riola beat you because the dude is a true freshman. As good as he's been, at the end of the day, true freshmen make mistakes because they're not used to being under that college pressure as it relates to the line. You're going to get confused. Little things. Now, I think the kid's ceiling is bright, but... The, the lights are also super bright right now. Indiana has to trust their pass defense because that's the same defense that has held opponents to an average of 170 yards per game, despite every opponent needing to try to pass to get themselves back into games because they have been absolutely knocking people's doors off. So that is dope. And with all of that said, I got to take the Indiana Hoosiers minus six and a half. This feels like easy work to me. Next game up, Alabama at Tennessee plus three. Now, Tennessee is about to host Alabama for the first time since Hendon Hooker knocked off the Crimson Tide. But this is honestly less of a revenge game and more a fight for survival because both of these teams have not looked good recently. They came out the season like gangbusters and everybody's like, oh my God, look at these teams. And Alabama beat a Wisconsin team that lost their starting quarterback, Tyler Van Dyke. And Wisconsin was in the game for the first half. It ran away from him in the end of the third, fourth quarter. Alabama barely escaped South Carolina. Tennessee, they started out the season. North Carolina State, they were like, oh my God, this team's amazing. They're scoring a billion points a week. Well, after they ran into Norman, Oklahoma and only scored 25, remember, Tennessee fans tried to tell me, oh man, they they just parked the bus, you know, uh, coach just knew, coach Heupel knew that, you know, they didn't need to score anymore, protect the freshmen, protect the football. Well, they haven't been putting up a lot of points since. And on the Alabama side, they barely escaped South Carolina last week. And something is clearly up with this defense. This ain't the Nick Saban defense of, of old. Because the last time Alabama surrendered 99 points over a three-game stretch was in 2018. But that was against the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back top five opponents at the end of the season. 
and it wasn't Vanderbilt, fam. It was not Vanderbilt. So there's something going on and people think it's Kalen DeBoer's shirt or uh, the way he dresses or anything else. No, this is a team that reloaded. They got a really good quarterback in Jalen Milrow, but this defense is letting them down and the offense has been inconsistent as well. Now, Jalen Milrow, their quarterback though, the dude is absolutely carrying this team at this point in time. And he'll have to be special again on the road to overcome a talented volunteers pass rush and a good secondary. But the question is though, what is going on with this Tennessee offense? Cause scoring dropped from over 60 points a game to 20 points once SEC play started. Now, now granted, yes, the SEC has some really good football teams, but that's 40 points a game less. That don't make no sense. Cause both Florida and Oklahoma made Tennessee's run game look very human. And over the last three games, Nico Iamalava is only averaging about 15 completions per game and under 200 yards as well. Now the question is, will this Neyland Stadium crowd singing Rocky Top, we will always be, <laughs> will they be loud and try to take that title back of the loudest stadium, college football stadium from the Oregon Ducks after the Ohio State game when Alabama comes to town? Could this Alabama defense be the cure for what ails this Tennessee offense? Or will Jalen Milrow extend drives and give the Crimson Tide's defense the rest it needs to stay in this game? This one I wrestled with so hard because I don't trust the Tennessee offense, but then I don't trust the Alabama defense either. And I think the home crowd is going to be the difference in this one. So I like the home team in Tennessee to cover plus three in this game. Next game up, wow, this deep into the season, we're getting matchups like Georgia at Texas. Now, while this feels like a non-conference matchup, this is an SEC matchup, and Texas is favored by five points. Now, one thing that happened this week that I did not agree with is that the Associated Press, the AP Top 25, saw Oregon beat Ohio State and still decided that Texas deserved the top ranking. Well, now the Longhorns, y'all got a chance to prove the media right. Because beating a Georgia team that threw for 460 yards last week against Mississippi State, it's going to be a tough one. But the question is, why did it take so much to beat Mississippi State? Mississippi State has been getting their heads beat in all year. How did Georgia give up 31 points? It, it was inexplicable. Inexplicable considering what we feel about Georgia. And remember, this is the thing that I keep telling everybody about, the logos on the jersey. We get so enamored by the logos on the jersey and try to wish away and shoo away bad things that we saw with our own two eyes on tape because it's Georgia. Oh, Kirk Kirby will get it fixed. We give them the benefit of the doubt, but we won't give a team like Indiana the benefit of the doubt when they've been putting it on film every single week. I'm just saying, fam. Now, on the Texas Longhorns side, their defense, particularly the pass defense, has been one of the best in the country. And oddly enough, the only team to throw for 200 yards against Texas is Michigan. Unbelievably. But that quarterback's on the bench for Michigan. Mm, tell me if that makes sense. Uh, and then you got Carson Beck. He might actually be in for a long afternoon because this Texas defense is much better than probably any defense that he's seen all year. Now, offensively for Texas, they got Quinn Ewers back in the saddle. He got revved up last game in the Red River rivalry against Oklahoma. Now, it didn't start out well, but then the kid actually finished the game pretty well after being off for three weeks. I don't think that anybody expected, well, sensible people didn't expect him to come out and not be rusty, because I definitely did. And Quinn Ewers has wins over Alabama last year at Alabama and Michigan under his belt already. But if he really wants to cement his legacy as one of the greatest college football quarterbacks of all time, he's got to take out Georgia on his way to a second consecutive college football playoff appearance. Now, where Texas has actually been excelling lately 
is their running game. They've had running backs get hurt and they've still been able to average around 200 yards and four touchdowns on the ground over their last three games. And this Georgia run defense has given up two or more rushing touchdowns in four different games this year. That is not the recipe for success if you are the Georgia Bulldogs. And Georgia's offensive line has not been protecting Carson Beck. They haven't been able to run the ball at the level that they want. And people are starting to be like, oh wait, hold up. Listen, man, you can't win a national championship every single year. And the expectations have grown like crazy insane. Yes, is Georgia still one of the better teams in the nation? Yes, but they are no longer a an elite team unless they can prove it this weekend. They'll just be a really good team that probably should be in the playoff, and we'll see if they get in. But the recipe for Texas minus five, which I am taking, Texas minus five, the recipe for Texas to have success here is to pound the rock with Trey Wisner, Jaden Blue, and Jarrett Gibson. That's going to be how they win this football game. And then Quinn Ewers making plays when he gets the opportunity. Now we're heading over to Champaign, Illinois, because the Michigan Wolverines are heading out there to play Illinois. And uh, somebody explained to me how Illinois is an underdog at home in this game, because these two teams feel exactly the same, except for Illinois has a better quarterback in Luke Altmaier. And this kid has improved from last year. And it's actually got to be one of the better glow ups in college football, maybe alongside like Kay Klubnik. The Illini quarterback already has more touchdown passes through six games than he had all of last year. And the kid has cut his interception numbers from once every 27 pass attempts last season to once in every 164 this year. And a big part of Luke Altmaier's emergence has been their wide receiver duo of Pat Bryant and Zakiri Franklin. That's a good duo, and it has given him some trust in them. But the question is, what does Illinois need to do to beat Michigan? It is similar to what they did to beat Nebraska. Sell out a thousand percent, not 100, not 200, not 500. And I know that the Grady's are going to go as 100 percent, but they got to stop the run and they got to make Alex Orgy or whoever else is under center for Michigan try and beat their DBs in single coverage because Michigan ain't going to throw it. They're not going to throw it, and if they do try to throw it, they don't have enough experience and a good enough quarterback to be able to do it in a high-level fashion. Now, if Illinois does lose to Michigan, now, if Michigan does beat Illinois, this will be impressive because it'll be their seventh straight win over the Illini. And check this out. It'll actually be the fifth Illinois head coach to lose to the Wolverines over that time period. That's when you know you're having some real coaching turnover. But I'm going to tell you this, I'm feeling a broken streak coming on. Give me Illinois plus three, baby. I'm taking the Illini to win this game. And the run-stuffing linebacker core of Gabe Jacobs, Dylan Rosiak, and Seth Coleman. Listen, they're going to put a kibosh on that Michigan run game and force them to throw it. But will Michigan throw it? Because if they do, it will surprise everybody. Now, there is one game that we all need to stay away from and that is Utah at TCU. Now, historically, it always makes sense to bet on the Utes at home. And I'm not telling you to stay away from betting this game because of Cam Rising's injury and being out for the year. I'm telling you to stay away from this game because if defensive coordinator Morgan Scally struggled with anything, it's been air raid concepts throughout his career. Now, Sonny Dykes over at TCU was one and one against Utah while he was at Cal. And Utah struggled quite a bit with Mike Leach in his time at Washington State running the air raid. Now, Utah could actually end up running all over TCU with Michael Bernard and cover this four and a half point spread with their true freshman Isaac Wilson under center. Now, if the old concepts of the mesh with the air raid force the Utah defense to have trouble and their freshman Isaac Wilson isn't helping the Utes sustain long drives, that means that the TCU Horn Frogs could actually be the team in purple celebrating Utah's first home loss since Oregon stuffed them in a locker in 2023. But now I wanted to talk just for a second about this Oregon game. Oregon goes to Purdue. This game has trap game written all over it. 
Oregon just beat Ohio State last week. Huge emotional win. And then they got to go on the road on a short week and play on a Friday night against Purdue. And Purdue is the team that had been getting their doors blown off all season. But they changed from Hudson Card at quarterback to Ryan Brown. And Ryan Brown threw for uh, over 300 yards last game and three touchdowns. And this offense pushed Illinois to the absolute max in a one-point win where they actually scored, I think, 49 points. Bro, that is going to be a tough game because if you're Dan Lanning, if you weren't in practice this week, making your team feel like that they weren't anything, that they hadn't accomplished anything, and that they escaped by and everything else, then he would be doing the wrong thing because you can't get caught in trap games. Alabama got caught in it, or they're not that good. Um, you've had a Ole Miss get caught by Kentucky. You've had a bunch of teams lose that about, well, with teams that they were way more talented than. And I think that Oregon is aware of that. And we're in a situation where, of course, there's going to be a lot of people who are wondering and wanting the downfall of them. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. Go Ducks. And there's another big Friday night game, and that is Oklahoma State visiting BYU. So BYU is undefeated right now. Number 13 in the country, 6-0 with the BYU at quarterback. Don't get mad at me. That's what he calls himself. And uh, Oklahoma State is three and three. They have bailed on their quarterback, Bowman, and are switching it up, or they might go back. Who knows? But this is a time where Oklahoma State can go on the road, and honestly, Mike Gundy can salvage his season with a win here and knocking BYU out of college football playoff territory or even putting them actually in a fight to get out of the Big 12 and knock off an undefeated team. Now, uh, BYU is a nine-point favorite in this game. And I'm actually going to take BYU because there is nothing that Oklahoma State has put on film this is BYU. They don't. They shouldn't have an emotional letdown in this game. They have been absolutely destroying Big 12 teams, and I expect them to continue doing it. Make sure that you guys like, subscribe, get notifications for the Unafraid Show, and most importantly, share, people. Share the show. Share the feed. I'm going to give you a second right now. Go down. Click it. Click it. Click it. Share and leave a thumbs up and everything in between.